I would like to introduce to you uh, Han Admiral. Han is the chairman of the Space Underground Committee of the ITA, International Tunneling Association. And that is one of the organizations that we have established uh, close contacts uh, with. And uh, Hans is an, uh, Han is an engineer by background, and you realize that when you visit his office, he has got a, a huge uh, model in built in Lego, and everything works, of a excavation machine, a mining <laughs> excavation machine, what they use in open pit mining, uh, that really doesn't stroke with our sustainability uh, <laughs> ambitions. But, um, okay, um, Han, I'll leave you the word. Yes, thank you for this marvelous introduction. Um, I'm actually also a member of the International Society of City and Regional Planners. And they kind of accepted me on the premise that I might be a civil engineer by trainer, but I'm also kind of a planner by heart. Um, and that machine has more to do with my love for Lego in Denmark than what it actually depicts. But now we're talking about it. Those mining machines are actually quite ingenious devices, but hey, they do scar the landscape, don't they? They build these big mines in, in they just scrape away at the surface and they attack the subsurface and they leave enormous, well, what do they leave behind? Big holes in the ground, basically. So in that sense, it represents everything I don't want to stand for. So um, let's go to my presentation and, uh, and see if I can explain that a little bit. I want to talk to you about the future as we see it. And I want to talk to you about the fact that we see our future in space, that we are reaching out into outer space in desperation. Now we should have sound, somehow it's disappeared. Help! Does anybody know how the sound comes on here? Well that's not going to be of much use when we... Uh... Oh. You can hear it right I, we, have, we did have sound this okay, morning. Unless it's somebody's Put the microphone in the crosswalk. We will restart in about two minutes. <laughs> Turn on this one again, probably. Okay, we'll get there. 
presentations go quite well. But, um, the, po the point of this, um, this slide was um, there's a big discussion going on about should we go into outer space or you know do we choose to stay on this planet and you might think that's something wild but if you think about Mr. Musk with his plans for shooting people around the moon for going to Mars and they're all presenting these things. There's a Japanese firm that's actually proposing to build this thing and to reach out into outer space. And what I find interesting about that concept is that we're trying to explore a bit of space we don't know all that much about. We don't know what the effects of uh, human activities in outer space will be. We already know that we've made quite a mess of the, uh, uh, the outer space around our planet with all the debris that's, uh, that's uh, circling there and everything. So there's actually quite an interesting comparison between what is happening in outer space and underground space. The only difference is that we're spending millions on going into outer space and looking back as far as we can see. And when it comes to underground space, we have a bit of a problem in trying to imagine what is there and taking decisions based on that. But let's say we choose to stay. Then we need to talk about what cities do we actually want to live in? What cities do we need on our planet? And we often say that these cities need to be resilient, that they need to develop sustainably, that they need to be inclusive, that they need to be livable. That is what we want our cities to be. We've defined sustainable development goals, 17 of them. Rarely do I hear anybody speak about how does the subsurface or how does the use of underground space, what we all envisage, how can that contribute to some of these goals that we've set ourselves as humanity, basically? Is that what goals set by the United Nations are goals set for humanity, for a better planet? Jacques, in his presentation, quoted the document The Cities We Need, which is produced by the, uh, the uh, World Urban Congress, isn't it? Forum? No, anyway. Yeah, um, and, and there was this interesting thing in it which says the cities we want should be engines of economic development that lie at the core of a new urban era where people can find freedom, innovation, prosperity and resilience. So the future we want is about the cities we need. But the cities we need should know about underground space and should know why underground space is there and why it could be used. But it's also about the challenges that we face. And some of the challenges are well known. A couple of, about two years ago, I saw this graph and it said the threshold of danger is about two degrees. Then the World Bank said there's no certainty humans can adapt to a four degree world. And the graph on the, the right is actually one that was recently produced by, by NASA. It's one of these American agencies that will have to find a different tune, but up to now they're still producing good data, I think. Um, but the red line is the northern hemisphere warming and we're going well past 1.2 degrees already. So it says something about what we should be thinking about, it says something about how we should be acting and it maybe says something about how we should be developing our cities. And when we talk about underground space and when we talk about the use of the subsurface, I think these things need to come into the equation as well. Why is it that we should be using underground space? regulations limiting new buildings to eight floors. 
Imagine that historic city center needing new social and transport infrastructure, living and office space, leisure facilities. Where would you find the space to fit all this in? You'd find it here, in the Earth Scraper, a 65 floor deep inverted skyscraper. This is all the space you need with no compromise on the existing urban fabric. The earth scraper is an inverted pyramid with a central void allowing all underground habitable space to enjoy natural light and ventilation. In the last 30 years, the world has had to cope with nearly three and a half thousand floods. Intense rainfall is now a major hazard for cities. So imagine a city with a thriving central business district, but one that is flooded on average once a year, severely disrupting commercial life. How can you prevent this? In Kuala Lumpur, you do it the smart way, with an underground solution combining both a road and a stormwater management tunnel. Next, imagine a city under threat from major earthquakes. A city that has previously experienced the collapse of its vital infrastructure, severely hindering disaster relief efforts. Now imagine that same city <coughs> making use of resilient underground infrastructure, much less susceptible to earthquakes. A city where even after a major quake, essential aid can be distributed life protected. As the world's population increases, our cities are becoming increasingly overcrowded, the available space almost all taken. But cities must be livable to be loved. They need open and green areas, public spaces for a society to enjoy. Imagine creating those spaces below the surface, parkland beneath the urban centre. Meet the Lola, a private initiative in the Lower East Side of New York City, reusing an unwanted, forgotten, underground tramway depot, giving it a new life. Now imagine your city using its underground space, becoming more resilient against natural disaster and the effects of climate change, developing sustainably through the use of geothermal energy, integrating surface and below surface development, creating new connections and increasing livability rapidly transporting people through underground systems that double up as cargo and disaster relief infrastructure. We know about underground space. Now you know too. It can't be my phone because I switched it off, so I don't know whose it is. But um, the point about the earthscraper before you all think this guy is totally mad, but it was a genuine volume study done by architects, and it is the one thing that has captured the imagination of people throughout the world. Okay, it captured the attention of the BBC. It captured the attention of a lot of magazines. And sometimes it is not just about, let's say, concrete proposals to do something, but it has something to do with catching the imagination of people and then thinking about what our cities could be, uh, could be like. Our cities are places of human interaction, social and economic activity and creativity. They need open public spaces which play a key role as meeting and recreational places for people. Those green spaces help filter out CO2. And some of that greenery also helps in avoiding uh, effects like urban heat islands in reducing temperatures of cities. But the resource land is being used up at an alarming rate and the sprawl of cities needs to be contained. 
The question is, does underground space offer a strategic alternative? But if we look at it in that way, isn't that very much looking at underground space as a solution to our cities that are under pressure? And if you look at what Uto Gian said in 1937, I found it fascinating, this, this quote from him. He says about underground urbanism that they were promoting in France at the time. He says, this is in no way an advocacy of underground living or of burying man who was destined to live in the sun and open air. Rather, underground urban development must contribute to better utilization of urban space by hiding underground the various city systems that are a nuisance and an encumbrance when placed on the surface placing them where certainly high-rise structures cannot be considered. But if we look at underground space in that way, aren't we looking at it as like an urban surface layer? Let's bury everything below the surface that we don't want at the surface. And even renowned architects do this. Foster and Parker proposed this for Hong Kong. And it says traffic and pollution below. Is that what, how we want to start using the underground space if we start using it? And this is basically why we need planning. And we don't need just urban planning. We need what I would call think deep planning. And think deep about in two, in two dimensions. Think deep in terms of going below the surface. And the other one is to really think deep about what we're going to do there. So as a committee on underground space, we do promote the urban underground as a standard component for urban planning. And why do we think that is required? Well, basically, we need to plan in order to stimulate mixed use and integrated use of underground space. Because what we've up to now been doing is we've been placing all kinds of mono-use and non-integrated underground space uses below the surface. We tend to put tunnels below the surface that do one thing. They carry people in a train or in a metro or they let cars drive through them. But they take up an awful amount of space but they only serve one purpose, whereas our cities are looking for a lot of other services that are required. So without planning, we can get an underground chaos. Because as we saw in the uh, presentation just before lunch, if you start working on the first come, first serve principle, that is not going to give you the quality in that you might desire in your city. And concepts like the subtropolis might even become totally impossible. So what we require and that's what I think what Cross Suburban is, is mostly about, is an in-depth knowledge and understanding of the existing underground space in terms of use and geology. We need to acknowledge that there might be certain limitations by geology, and we need to think about mixed use, but that requires cross-policy silo thinking, which is something that sometimes is to see, seem to be impossible, but can actually be achieved. And then we can start thinking about projects like this water filtration plant, which is built just recently in uh, New York City. They placed the plant below the surface in order to place a green roof <coughs> on top of the surface. And this is a golf uh, driving range that they've turned the roof of the facility into. And what you see here is that whereas it takes 1.3 billion liters per day water in terms of its filtration uh, plant activities, there's a nine acre golf driving range on top. And it's a combination of urban infrastructure with public space and with recreation. There's an American professor, Hilary Brown, who is actually promoting next generation infrastructures. And she says that she has five principles for next generation infrastructure. And those five are mixed land use, mitigating CO2 production, incorporating green infrastructure, integrating social and or economic benefits for the surrounding communities and including climate adaptation measures. And what she says is that basically we should stop with producing or, or uh, constructing new infrastructure without considering these five principles. Because if we do combine these things like you just saw in the previous example, then we can achieve so much more. This is the taking those five principles to the, uh, to the extreme. This is the Trans Bay Transit Center in San Francisco, which is currently uh, being constructed. And here you see a transportation hub, but it's more than just a transportation hub. It's a total redevelopment of part of the city. It provides a green roof, as you see. It's, there's an urban park right up there. But that urban park serves more uh, um, 
more uses than just um, providing people with, with some nice recreation. It captures water as well. So the total water usage of that facility is being reduced because they have grey water tanks that capture the, the rainwater. And here you can see some of the sustainable principles that are included into the, into the whole structure. And you can see that they use geothermal applications as well for, for the energy. As, you, as I said, the green roof is here. They have a kind of ventilation shaft here which uh, can help in, in, in cooling and letting out the heat from the, from the underground uh, metro uh, system. So there's a lot of things that they've been incorporating into this whole facility. is about how we can integra integrate the underground space into the, into the urban fabric and how we can build facilities that do more than just provide a transit hub where people just go from one mode to the other mode. So when it comes to the urban underground future, I think there are a couple of enablers for change, I would, I would call them, that we need to look at. We need to think about connectivity, we need to think about urban system integration, creating linkages and urban reuse of spaces. And I'll go quickly through those as an example. Connectivity, the way we connect ourselves, not only in terms of transport, but in terms of the transport of goods, might actually be changing rapidly. We also require connectivity for all the other things that we're doing. We see in terms of the energy and the, uh, the chemical transition, things like industrial uh, symbiosis is is one thing requiring a lot of extra uh, pipes to connect up indus industries to make the, uh, the whole operation more carbon uh, neutral. This is an example of uh, Cargo Souterrain pro project in Switzerland. That is not feasibi feasibility studies, but past the feasibility studies entering the design phase. They're going to build the first part of a total network. Here the orange part is about 67 kilometers. That's going to be built. And the interesting thing about this enterprise is that there's not a Swiss franc of government money going into the project. It's totally privately financed. The role of the government here is much more of an enabler of maybe changing some legislation here and there to allow uh, this, uh, this project to, to go through. So we can see that the whole thinking about uh, the, the use of underground space in terms of transport, and these are all uh, self-driven vehicles. So there are no, uh, there's no people involved in them and they will deliver the goods somewhere in the city totally automatically taking on this whole concept of, uh, of driverless vehicles. When it comes to urban system integration, I think there are interesting examples. I've taken one from, uh, from the city of Rotterdam, obviously. I need to get one of them into please, Ignaz. Um, this is the museum park uh, car park. And, and what it does is it actually provides an underground car park to the city in an area where that is needed. But it's been combined with a underground water storage basin. So when we have freak rainfall events in the city of Rotterdam, and the canals are about to overflow, we can let them stream off into this basin. There's a huge capacity to store the water. And the water is stored then until the rain is passed, and then we can pump out the water again. 
and it's a brilliant system. And what makes it interesting is that these two concepts of water management and car parking have been incorporated in one project. If you're going to build something, then you know you might go a little bit deeper and combine these projects. So that's what we call uh, urban system integration. Urban corridors, we've already talked about, I think, when, uh, when, when Jacques showed the example of Montreal, this is path in, uh, in Toronto. The point I want to make with this, uh, this map of the underground system in, in Toronto is that we so often look at the development of the underground space in terms of networks and in terms of basements and we forget to link them up. And we forget to link them up because public space doesn't exist below the surface unless you actually build it or construct it. And this is also a reason why when we're planning the under use of underground space, we need to think about how we can actually connect up at the minus one level these um, initiatives that have been taken. And another one we're seeing is urban reuse. If you go to Helsinki, a lot of the underground spaces in Helsinki were already there because they're former civil defence shelters that are being reused. And we're seeing in London the reuse of old civil defence shelters to grow mushrooms and other produce. So there is actually urban farming activities going on beneath the streets of London, providing London restaurants with produce. So that's an interesting thing if you're talking about ecosystem services. Is, is this an ecosystem service or is this use of underground space? I don't know. But it's, it's providing something to the city anyway. There's an initiative going on to use a disused underground line to, to actually redevelop that in an underground cycle way because it's a lot safer to cycle beneath the streets of London than actually in the streets of London. And this is another example of reuse. So there, there's quite a lot of thinking going on about how can we actually reuse our spaces that are already there and continue to the, to the city <coughs> in, in that way. About 20 years later, Utu Jiang said something else. And he said it is necessary that the urban planner thinks deep and that underground development of cities is done not through random necessities, but according to a definite commitment, legislation and a predetermined plan. Now, he said that in 1954. That is what we are still talking about now. And I think it is the random necessities that we need to kind of get out of the system. Because it's those random necessities that we are um, that are actually spoiling the actual use of our underground spaces. If we have massive geothermal applications beneath the city going running down 1500 meters or, or more and no idea how deep they go but they go a bit deeper than the normal piles we see beneath buildings then how are you going to plan for your next alignment for an underground in that city when you need it how's that going to run and it's not that i'm saying that you shouldn't be doing these geothermal applications but what we're saying is that you should have a vision on how the urban spaces beneath the city can be used and should be used for the benefit of that city. And from that vision then comes the way we, we can actually use them and how we can start combining maybe systems. Um, and maybe then we don't need the pipes running down, maybe the actual underground metro system can provide the heat as well or the energy. But in order to achieve that, we need planners and engineers to come together we'll throw in the geologists as well just for the sake of argument <laughs> now what, what i'm saying is we need we need an under, what i call an underground space dialogue and it's it is insufficient from each of our own domains to start developing ideas on how uh, we can use the underground spaces what how we should do it what we should look at it the time has come to bring all this knowledge together and to start the dialogue with each other and this is where planning also should start planning should start with with a dialogue we are trying to, to do this with, uh, with the uh, ITA Committee on Underground Space. We have, as of now, two activity groups. One is called the Young Professionals Team D Programme. We recently did a workshop in uh, the city of Glasgow. The report is, uh, is available online. And what we tried to do was to do exactly what I mentioned, have a dialogue between engineers and architects and planners um, and, and urban designers about a real life case and we're doing this together with ISACAR 
because we would like to publish a book in about two years time with five cases of these workshops and the methodologies that we can derive from those workshops and it's very much getting the young professionals involved in these kind of workshops as well to not only appreciate that they can actually talk to each other and understand each other but they can also come up with a lot better and creative ideas the moment they, they do this. What we also have is our national actions program. Ithacus is very much about connecting at the international level with societies like ISOCARP and trying to get them to appreciate the underground space as an asset as well which, uh, which they, they need to look at in their, their planning practice. If we can replicate that at the national level then I think a lot of uh, things can happen. I'm happy to say that in the UK this, this challenge has been uh, taken up by Think Deep UK. Loretta will be talking about uh, Think Deep UK on Thursday I think. Um, and essentially Think Deep UK is, is a group of very enthusiastic professionals from various disciplines, this is my last slide, uh, yes. um, who, who come together and they, they share one common interest which is the subsurface. But they all talk from their own uh, professional domains and they try to come up with new ideas and, uh, on, on uh, subsurface planning. And this is the last slide, an invitation if you want to join us. You can become an institutional member of Ethicus. It's rewarding and free, as we always say. You can join our LinkedIn group, which is free as well. Um, and there are two congresses that I would like to point out. The W2C 2017 in Norway, in Bergen, which is coming up in June. And late this year in uh, October, the ISOCARP conference on smart cities. And if any of you think uh, you want to know more about underground space or contribute in some way, these conferences, uh, please visit the websites uh, to, uh, to get more information. And that's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Holly. Any uh, questions after this uh, excellent presentation for Holly? Cole. Oh. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on uh, data. So we've heard all the way through this action about lack of data or the <coughs> visibility of it. If we're going to advocate doing more stuff in the underground, for example, is that San Francisco example or any of the others that you showed, going to put that information into the public domain, especially if they're being done by private companies? I, th I think the, um, the, whole, the whole concept of the, uh, as, as you say, the data that's gathered by these projects and putting them into, into databases to gather more knowledge, uh, like it's being done in Glasgow, for example, is, is, has not really been taken up by, uh, by a lot of uh, uh, cities around the world, uh, let alone uh, uh, nations. Um, but I do, I do, when I say that we need an in-depth knowledge of the subsurface before we can do anything, that actually implies that we need to know um, what is there and we need to look at how we are maybe influencing it with human interventions and whether that's a good thing or not and in order to be able to do that you do need the data uh, as, as you say so um, but unfortunately it's it's in the Netherlands in the UK things things are happening in that sense but uh, I wouldn't know any other examples okay Gillian I was just going to expect the answer to Carl's question because the workshop that was done in Glasgow used the Arsenal Network data, yeah. it used data from BGS, it used our development plan data. Um, and it was quite a nice slide you had there because the older guy in it was actually a geologist. Yeah. That's Donald from our geotech was busy talking to the young professionals. We kind of, they asked questions and then we brought the data holders in to actually answer the questions um, rather than leaving them with questions hanging in the air. Mm -hmm. So it, it matched the challenge people think of way or go something to dig or we thought about that five years ago and didn't do it but it brought ideas back up to the surface to avoid the fire. Okay. Any more? One last question. We are running a bit behind schedule so I would like to speed up. If you want a model number for the Lego model I can give you that one. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>